and we'll start at a couple minutes after. As you're settling in, also feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat bar with name. If you shared pronouns, you could share those where you're joining us from, whatever you want us to know. Thanks. Hello and welcome to this session of the Walk, Bike, Roll Summit 2021. Welcome and feel free to introduce yourselves into the chat bar. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Barb Chamberlain. I am the Director of the Active Transportation Division at Washington State Department of Transportation. I use she, her pronouns and I am joining you from the place that is now known as Olympia, Washington. Welcome to the Washington Bike, Walk and Roll Summit. We're really excited to have you with us for a five-day virtual event. And we're really thrilled to have folks from so many communities joining us from around the state and beyond. We wanna start with a land acknowledgement. The summit is virtual and those participating are joining us from many lands. We acknowledge the land the Cascade Bicycle Club headquarters sits on today as the traditional home of the Duwamish, Tulalip, Muckleshoot and Squamish tribal nations. If you don't know whose lands you're on, look in the chat in a minute and you'll find a link to a map you can use to look up your place on the land. Without them, we would not have access to this environment. We take the opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here. We'd also like to know that we are recording this session and it will be available following the summit. The summit is hosted by Cascade Bicycle Club and Washington Bikes, two sister statewide organizations with a shared vision of bicycling for all. Cascade serves bike riders of all ages and abilities throughout Washington State, educating new riders, advocating for safe places to ride, and holding events and rides. Washington Bikes advocates for bicyclists' rights, endorses political candidates, holds officials accountable, and works to shape policies that will make bicycling safe and accessible for all. We want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, whose collective contributions have enabled us to bring together 15 panels with expert speakers with registration free for all attendees. Thanks to our sponsors, Amazon and the Washington State Department of Transportation. I'll now quickly introduce the session panelists and topics. This keynote session with Alex Hogar and Liz Jackson takes us into a session in which the stories we tell about design inform the assumptions we make in practice. One such story centers our infrastructure and the information it's built on. Join Alex and Liz to discuss their pragmatic approach to creating designs that include perspectives that have been historically undervalued, underpaid, and underutilized. This design process begins by asking designers to analyze their intentions. It is through this mindset that we will interrogate the groundwork, outreach, and research required to accurately scope a project. Attendees will be encouraged to engage collaboratively with Alex and Liz throughout the duration of the summit, conducting an audit of a design plan. Designing through self-reflection helps us understand the misguided nature of centering the human and instead attunes us to ways in which we can most effectively decenter the designer. This presentation format has this introduction, a keynote, and 10 minutes for audience Q&A at the end. You're encouraged to ask questions via the chat bar, and we'll, we'll be monitoring the chat, and I'll be asking the questions of Alex and Liz. And at the end, please provide feedback on this session through the provided Google form. All the registrants were informed of a set of community norms in your welcome email. If you feel these agreements aren't being met or you feel uncomfortable, please direct message the folks with an asterisk at the front of their names so we can assist. We're working to create brave spaces for conversations and we'll maintain a standard of respect as well as a space for growth. 
I mentioned we also greatly value your attendee feedback. So watch for that link to the Google feedback form in the chat at the end of the session. And we'll also include that in an email at the end of the day. I'm now going to pass it on to Alex and Liz to introduce themselves and dive into the session. Thanks so much. Um, oh, I was just wondering if Alex was here or not. So Alex, um, we were having te technical difficulties earlier. Thank you so much for the wonderful um, introduction, Barb. Um, and it's so great to be here with all of you. I was reading your um, intros or your um, um, chat on the side, and it, it seems to me that um, we have a lot of people from various cities and municipalities. Um, so after I do a quick access statement, I'm just going to kind of touch on language um, a little bit before I throw over to Alex. Um, so first thing is first, uh, something that we have learned by doing work in disability spaces is that um, when, so if you're uh, talking in chat on the side, um, if there's somebody who has a screen reader um, that is using a screen reader to navigate this, whatever is typed on the side will actually be announced over what it is that we're saying in the chat. Um, I say this because we very much do want your questions and comments and do hope that you will add them in, in the side. But if you're doing the really gracious thing of offering us snappy snaps or you know a plus one, I would kindly request you hold off just to keep um, the conversation as clear as possible. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, the second thing is, is um, Alex and I are each gonna take a moment to describe ourselves. Um, I am a white queer woman, a queer person. I've got olive skin. I'm wearing uh, a neon pink um, hat and a flannel shirt and I am in uh, my apartment. So there are some pictures in the background. Uh, do you wanna describe yourself, Alex? Yes, thanks. And also, I just want to warn everyone, I am having technical difficulties lately with Zoom, so if I disappear very suddenly, I apologize and I will be back as soon as I can. Um, I cannot figure out what's going on there. Um, anyway, I am Alex Hagard, uh, or Hogor, sorry, I've actually started going back to the original... <laughs> I started going back to the original Scandinavian uh, pronunciation rather than the anglicized version, but I also have a very embedded habit of using the anglicized pronunciation. So I'm Alex Hogor. My pronouns are they, them. I'm joining you from so-called Kingston, Ontario, which is a small city about halfway between Toronto and Montreal on the unceded lands of the Haudenosaunee, Huron-Wendat, and Mississauga. Um, I am a white non-binary person. I've got uh, short blonde hair that's kind of a little bit longer on top and like kind of goes towards a little bit of a spike in the middle um, and uh, shaved close on the sides. Um, I'm wearing a white and dark gray striped shirt with a small stand collar, uh, a necklace with a wrought iron Ouroboros and a large nugget of amber. And behind me, I have a shelf that has an impractical number of plants on it, a couch with a dragon-shaped reading pillow, and possibly somewhere behind me, a small dog who may chime in at some point as well. Uh, Safi is is the best dog. Um, one other thing, it, it appears to be golden hour here. I'm on um, the East Coast, so um, if I sort of look like a beauty reel, um, it's not really my fault. And I really wasn't going for this look. Um, the last thing is, is uh, we are um, both chronically ill and neurodivergent. Um, and so this means sometimes we want our screens off. Sometimes we want our screens on. Uh, feel free to do whatever makes you comfortable. We take frequent bathroom breaks. Uh, feel free to do the same for yourself. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to pose them in the chat. Uh, so the reason that I want to get started with language is that I imagine, especially if you're working in a city or a municipality, um, that you have been taught to use uh, what is called person first language. Uh, and so that essentially is a person with disability. Um, but both Alex and, and myself use identity first language. And so we refer to ourselves as disabled people. Um, and the reason I say this is because we're gonna be talking a lot about research, how to reach disabled people. And it feels really important just to point out that um, who, who you um, are actually, the language you use is gonna bring to you two totally different um, pools of people. If you use person first language, it will oftentimes help you in reaching um, sort of more institutional spaces, schools, hospitals, um, medical settings, parents especially. Um, and also if you use identity first language as Alex and I do, 
that will mean that you're going to start to gain access to uh, activists, advocates, people who are really working in the disability justice space. There is something important to note, which is that um, the work that we do is always a process of going deeper. Um, and so within that, I do want to acknowledge um, one sort of kind of specific um, sort of exception that proves the rule, I would say. Um, so the reason that that um, people use person first languages is they're very much advocating for their personhood. Um, when you use identity first language, um, it's less a, it, it, what you're essentially saying is, is that your um, your experience of disability forms your identity. Um, but there are people in disability spaces who still do use person first language. And I would specifically point to um, intellectually uh, and developmentally uh, people with disabilities. Um, and again, because they're very much still in a place where they're um, advocating for their personhood. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of put out there, we're going to be using identity first. We assume if you work in a municipality and you yourself are not disabled identifying, you're probably using person first. Um, and if you work in intellectual and disability, developmental disability spaces, you're probably also using person first. Um, and so with that, I'm just going to throw to Alex to delve into um, the next phase. Um, yeah, so with this presentation, we we have a ton of ground that we're trying to cover. We're going to do our best to take you through it, and it may be at a little bit of um, a rapid clip, just because we, we want to try and take you through sort of some basics of just thinking about disability um, in ways that are a little bit more expansive than we often tend to think about them. Um, but also then giving you some practical tips for how to actually do engagement with, um, with disabled stakeholders, with the public, but specifically targeting disabled um, members of the public uh, who often may not be sort of as easily reachable through some of the traditional outreach channels that you use within your municipalities. Um, I am, that is not what I was trying to share. I'm trying to share an outline because, um, so one of the things that you may notice is that we, we don't have a slide presentation here. Liz and I don't use um, slide presentations um because we find so so we are both neurodivergent and for us we find it a little bit easier to speak somewhat extemporaneously and often we find that when we have slides we just sort of like tend to get really rigid about following them which doesn't make for a great presentation for any of us um that said also acknowledging that some people uh do a little bit better cognitively if they have something visual to follow along with so we've created this very dull looking outline there for you uh, trying not to make anything too exciting that would then sort of create inequity for people who may be screen reader users, for example. So just something that's the very basics of what we're going to be going through within this presentation with a couple of um, links as well to some of the concepts uh, that we talk about in there as well, some relevant resources. And the first one that you'll see is a link to a blog post from the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, talking a little bit more in depth about the history and importance of identity first language to a lot of disability communities. So with all of that said, we're going to start by talking to you about the ways in which disability is not a monolith, because this is this is sort of a, a common refrain within disability advocacy. And it's one that's really important to understand, because even sort of within disability self-advocacy spaces, there are a lot of nuances to disabled experience that tend to get flattened out for a lot of different sort of historical reasons. And the first one that I really want to call out is the fact that disabled people are not the same thing as elderly people. There are elderly disabled people, there is certainly uh, some overlap and elderly people do experience a lot of ableism, a lot of ageism that is experienced by elderly people is actually ableism. But they're not a one to one overlap. And it's really important to also keep in mind, especially when doing sort of civic urban design and policy, that there are also young disabled people, and they're going to be doing different things, they're, they're going to be having different needs in terms of using transit in terms of using infrastructure, because their lifestyles are quite different than potentially elderly disabled people. Another distance, uh, another difference that is worth thinking about is independent versus assisted living. So there are disabled people who, like Liz and myself, live on our own in apartments. There are also disabled people who live within 
sort of uh, supported living environments, so things like group homes. And there are also people who are sort of fully institutionalized. So for example, living within nursing homes and all of those people will have potentially very different access to different modes of transportation um, and different needs with regard to them. So for example, you know, Liz and I, um, you, we, we essentially have total freedom to go where we want, when we want. Um, we are able to use public transit. Um, I'm able to drive. I, Liz, I'm not sure if you're able to drive, um, but I, technically I can drive. I did not have a car, however, um, because a lot of disabled people also live uh, in uh, greater poverty than non-disabled people, and that's something we'll touch on later. Um, but again, just starting to think about some of the ways in which there is real huge diversity within the disabled community and some of the ways that that is going to influence um, not only the needs that people have with regard to urban and, and urban infrastructure and transportation, um, but the ways in which you're going to reach them. Because for example, independent living disabled people like Liz and I are gonna be a lot easier to reach when doing stakeholder engagement than someone who is in a group home or a nursing home. They have, you know, sort of much more limited freedom to sort of access social media. They may not even be able to afford devices. So thinking about how you're going to reach them if you're doing stakeholder engagement. And it's just as important, if not more so, to reach these people because they're among the most vulnerable within our community. Another difference um, that I feel really strongly about, as Liz mentioned, we are both chronically ill and chronically ill versus what we call chronically well. Um, I, I can't claim that term. I borrowed that from EB, who is a fantastic uh, chronically ill and autistic advocate on Twitter. I don't know, Liz, do you want to link their uh, handle too, if you can find it? I think it's EB then. Um, yeah. yeah. And so chronically ill versus chronically well is a really important distinction too, because we often think about, you know, I use a wheelchair. I'm an ambulatory wheelchair user. And I, at this point, use my wheelchair part time. Um, and when people who are used to seeing me in my wheelchair see me walking, they become shocked because they assume that my legs don't work. But what's interesting is, you know, the stereotype of the wheelchair user as someone who is paralyzed, there are actually huge, huge differences between someone who is paralyzed and someone who is, say, an, an ambulatory but chronically ill wheelchair user, because not only are there differences in terms of how our limbs actually function? But someone who is paralyzed does not necessarily deal with the kinds of energy limitations and the kinds of dynamic and unpredictable changes in our symptoms, in our capabilities, in our access needs and the barriers that we face. And so understanding the ways that um, the sort of the, the unique challenges that, that chronic illness can provide uh, to, access, to accessibility and the unique access needs that it presents, particularly around um, what I call temporal accessibility. So having to do with time, having to do with how you move through time, um, how much time and energy things take, energy limiting illnesses are really important, chronic pain, thinking about things like that because I always worry about saying anything about ramps because it's not like we do ramps well, but it's not just about ramps, you know, it, I, I can, I can technically get to a place that has a ramp, but that doesn't mean I can actually get to that place because it may, it may be that it's too far from the bus stop to get to that place for me to manage without exhausting myself to a point that I then can't feed myself the next day or do the job, do the work that I need to do the next day, or just be in immense pain the next day. So thinking about accessibility and infrastructure in terms of, not just of can you technically do the thing, but what is it actually going to cost that person in terms of energy, in terms of pain, in terms of time. And we're also gonna talk a little bit about how um, disabled people exist in what we call a state of temporal poverty, which means that we are, we just never have enough time. Um, so thinking about all of those things, as well as the sort of very strict definition of access as can you literally get into that space or not? And, so we also want to talk a little bit, because this is the, the bike walk roll conference, we also want to talk a little bit about how rolling differs from biking and walking, because, you know, I, I think there's sometimes a little bit of a perception that rolling is, is overall very similar to biking. And there are sort of real nuances to, um, to using a wheelchair that honestly, like I, as, as an ambulatory person, you don't realize until you start using a chair and until you start using a chair, sort of fairly regularly and doing so because you're dealing with, you know, chronic pain and or fatigue and or mobility issues. Um, and so, you know, the curb cut effect is if you've sort of 
done anything in the area of universal design, inclusive design. Um, it's this phenomenon that's that talks about how inclusive design, things that are designed sort of to be used by disabled people, to be used by, by people who have sort of more extreme, quote unquote, access needs, um, actually end up benefiting a much wider scope of people. And so this, this came from a study which found that after curb cuts or curb ramps, as they're known in some cities, uh, were installed in order to provide access to wheelchair users and other mobility device users, they started noticing that a lot of other people were using curb cuts as well. Um, so Okay, I'm, I'm gonna give Alex just 30. Oh, wait, are you back? You're on mute. I hope so. I'm gonna wait. I think sometimes when it, when it crashes out, it brings me back for like five seconds and then conks out again. Uh, we seem to be doing okay for now. Sorry, where did, what was I saying right when it cut out? Cause it sort of you froze for just, a second. You were just getting to the reverse curb cut effect. Okay, so did I did I talk about what the curb cut effect is known to be? All no. right, all well, that, that's fantastic. All right, so the curb cut effect is a thing that you will likely have heard of if you've done sort of any work in the spaces of universal and inclusive design. And what it comes from is the fact that when curb cuts or curb ramps, as they're sometimes referred to, were initially installed in order to provide access to disabled people, to mobility device users, um, something interesting happened, which was that municipalities and designers started finding that it was more than just the disabled people they were installed for who were using these curb, curb ramps or curb cuts. It was mothers with strollers, it was business people sort of pulling briefcases or you know suitcases and luggage. Um, and so that gave rise to what is known as the curb cut effect, this idea that there is a wider benefit. Accessibility provides a benefit to more than just the disabled people it's ostensibly for. But there is sort of another dimension to that, which is that <sighs> curb cuts are often installed in a way that works for everyone else but me as a wheelchair user. And so there's a curb cut at the intersection closest to my apartment building where it sloped all right, actually. The, the slope is perfectly fine. That's the one thing that works about it. But there's a hydro pole, which I think that's a Canadian term. It's an elect electric pole. I don't know what you all call them. They're for the electric wires. I don't know. Uh, it's a hydro pole. And so the curb cut is on the other side of the hydro pole from the pedestrian button. So if you want to get to the pedestrian button, which you have to, because this is one of those intersections that the light won't change unless you hit the button. So to get to the pedestrian button, you have to go past the curb cut along the sidewalk for a little bit around the hydro pole, hit the button, back up or turn around, get back down to the curb cut. Hope that happens in time that it's not already counting down for you by the time you get back to the curb cut. Confuse whoever's walking behind you as well as the cars that are waiting because they don't know what direction you're going. Hope that you don't get stuck on a snowbank in the winter because obviously they don't shovel it very well either because why would they? And then because the curb cut is also facing perpendicular to the direction you're trying to go, veer out into traffic and then try and get across. So like just all, technically it works fine for someone who is pulling a stroller or whatever because you know, they, they don't, they don't have as sort of substantial and specific needs around it. It's not as much of an issue because for them, they can even just sort of reach over and hit the button because they've got a longer reach because they're standing. There's just, there's so many more issues that it takes to make a curb cut functional for someone who's actually a wheelchair user versus for someone who is using it for convenience and who is ambulatory. Um, and similarly, there are other curb cuts near here that they're just, they're, they have this bizarre convex curvature, which even if the slope is technically okay, the convex curvature, it makes it really easy to catch your casters, the small front wheels at the front of your chair. If you don't hit it exactly right, you can catch your casters in sort of the little divot between the edge of the curb cut and the pavement, and then you can tip yourself forward, which is just absolutely fantastic when you're crossing a street. So just a whole host of issues that sort of seem to get glossed over often I suspect because we think about curb cuts just in the terms of is it there or is it not because we've gotten into this mindset of well it's for everyone and it works the same for everyone. So keeping in mind that even though everyone can often benefit from access measures 
the things that it takes to make an access measure functional for a disabled person are not necessarily the same as for the abled person who might also benefit from it. Other sort of small details that you literally just will not notice if your ambulatory is tilting sidewalks, depending. So I actually, when I'm wheeling, every couple blocks I will cross because every sidewalk tilts a little bit um, in one direction and my arm gets really tired after a block or two. And so I have to switch because if my joints dislocate spontaneously, if I get too tired, my shoulder goes out. And depending on, again, the availability of crosswalks, the availability of curb cuts, that can become really difficult. Um, and then similarly, construction barriers, you know, unlike a bike, I can't just hop off or, or an ambulatory person, I can't just hop off if there's construction, I can't just hop off the curb, I need to go back to wherever the last curb cut was. Rain, snow, ice and salt not only can be incredibly hard to wheel in, present literal barriers, but also can damage your chair, which is incredibly expensive. And again, disabled people live disproportionately with low income. So sort of all of these factors that range from the built environment to the natural environment um, can, can really change the experience of rolling versus biking and walking. And I'm gonna throw back to Liz. Um, hi everyone. So I'm not actually naturally um, a researcher. I'd actually go so far as to argue I'm not very good at it. What I am is, is I'm a storyteller and I'm someone who is really tracking and following the way that the stories that things are done um, get translated in this space. Um, and so this reverse curb cut effect that Alex was describing, it doesn't matter if it's UX or, uni universe or uh, industrial design, it doesn't matter what form of design it takes. The, it, the reality stays the same, which is that something that, that was initially done to create access eventually evolves to become, to be made inaccessible. Um, and so these are the sorts of things that I've really come to question in my work. Um, again, coming at this from um, not a research perspective, but again, sort of a story perspective and, and sort of learning to parse out stories and design. Um, one of the things that we started to notice last year, I don't know how many of you have ever been asked to take a, a diversity questionnaire, um, but you'll be asked a series of questions and they're just trying to kind of glean information about um, you know, diversity. Um, and within these uh, questionnaires or these surveys, there's always inevitably this, this singular um, disability question. And it's always so perplexing to me because again, as a storyteller, the thing that I'm asking is, is has anybody actually thought about what they want to get out of this question? Um, and I would sort of argue that no, like nobody really has thought about what they wanna get out of that singular disability question in a diversity questionnaire. Um, and what the diversity questionnaire usually asks is some uh, framing of um, what category of disability are you experiencing? Again, so it's gonna use person first language. It's not gonna attract people who might be skeptical of systems who are actually really beneficial to research. Um, but more than that, the way that they categorize it is always just so perplexing to me. Um, they don't say like, you know, are you experiencing some sort of mobility impairment? They tend to almost always ask, um, are you a wheelchair user? Um, another thing is, is I, um, I am Tourettic. I don't, um, I'm not autistic. Um, and so questions usually also tend to be framed around, um, when they're framed around neurodivergence, they're usually asking about autism. And so I tend to get left out of these questions, even though within that particular category, I would actually fit in if it was just asked in a different way. But again, I don't actually know what they want to get out of them. And I say this so much is because um, I wanted to, to kind of, I want to focus on the fact that wheelchairs aren't the only mobility device. I am a New Yorker. Um, and I had this experience where I went on, got on the subway with my cane. This is a couple of years ago. And it was a fairly full subway, but there were two um, teenagers sitting under or sitting on the, the subway seat that's under the accessible signage. Um, and so I just went over and I asked them, I said, can I have one of your seats? And they both looked at me and they looked up at the accessibility signage and then they looked back at me and they said, but you're not a wheelchair user, right? Because the, the accessibility signage shows a wheelchair user in it. And I said, but if I was a wheelchair user, I wouldn't want your seat. 
right? And so it's like we start to kind of bucket mobility. We start to bucket all of these things into these very kind of stringent categories. And it doesn't make room for someone like me um, to kind of fall outside of, of, of those conversations. Um, you know, I think of um, different people who are experiencing this similarly. And someone who comes to mind is, I don't know if anybody has encountered Elizabeth Guffey. Um, she's fantastic, um, a disabled designer. Um, and her assistive device is a suitcase. Um, it's a very, she's written extensively about it. It's a very specific suitcase. I think she gets it in Japan. Um, it's sturdy and, um, and it has really good wheels. Um, and the thing that she says is, so on curb cuts, right? And this also happens on subway platforms too. There's that yellow bumpy sort of ridge that is used to prevent people from slipping down too far, but it's completely impossible for her to traverse with this luggage that she uses to get around, right? And so these ways in which we, we conflict with the status quo um, and the things that are assumed, um, there's no real way to amplify that. And there's also no way for us to conflict and, and be in conflict with it without risking um, making, sort of having it taken away or making it seem sort of too complicated because in disability, all we want to do is simplify. Um, other, other things that, you know, we think of are power chairs, you know, when we tend to think of, um, of, of wheelchairs, right, we tend to think of manual chairs, especially in mobility. Um, but power chairs um, bring on a whole other set of requirements and circumstances. Um, you know, you can think about how weather, whereas it might be traversable in a manual chair, it could effectively uh, kill a power chair. I think we've all, probably all read about the, the power wheelchair users and their fears of traveling, especially on airplanes, because uh, flight attendants haven't figured out how to maneuver them safely yet. Um, and then, you know, things come up such as like temporary construction and, and are those boards on the ground, is it really safe enough for a power chair to traverse? Um, you know, I bring all this up and I guess I suppose I also bring up um, Elizabeth Guffey's suitcase because there are things that are um, innately an accessibility device and I don't think we regard them as such. And I think it's making it a lot more difficult for some of us to pr pursue this work. Um, I remember I went to um, South by Southwest a couple of years ago and I was there with um, a handful of disabled friends, some chronically ill, some had um, you know, physical disabilities. Um, and essentially what South by Southwest does is they shoot, they shut down the entire city. So there's no cars so that people can walk in the streets and it's safe to get from place to place. But what this had the effect of doing was, is it made it impossible for us as a group to get from point A to point B. And so what I wanna do is I actually wanna throw back to Alex so that we can start to consider how cars actually assist us. And I, I recognize the um, strangeness of, of talking about cars as an assistive device at a, an active transportation conference called Bike Walk Roll. But I think there's a really important reason we need to talk about it, which is that if we are trying to figure out ways to reduce people's reliance on cars, we need to understand the reasons why people rely on cars. And for disabled people in particular, cars are quite literally a mobility device. And so th there are a myriad reasons, and I'm going to speak about it from my perspective as someone who very much does need a car, even though I also cannot afford a car currently. But so this, this also gets into a little bit of what Liz was talking about, about the, the types of disability experience and the ways that disability, certain disabilities sort of are erased in just the way we think about disability, the way we design policy for it. And so some of you may have heard of this idea of the social model, which is a really important way of thinking about disability that came about sort of with, with the early disability rights movement. And it says that disability is not a, a fundamental limitation within the body. It's not something that like, there's something wrong with your body and it needs to be corrected. It's something that's actually imposed on you by society. It's society excluding people with atypical bodies and minds. And that is a really, really important framing. And like, I wanna, I wanna sort of state that disclaimer up front that it is a really important thing for disability history and disability rights and policy. But also within that framing, there are certain things that we erase. So for example, you, you tend to get this focus on 
disabilities that sort of interact with the built environment and tend to not think about the ways in which disabilities can actually be really severely impacted by the natural environment too. So for example, for myself, I'm quite literally allergic to the weather where I live for like about eight months of the year. I have an autoimmune disorder that makes me allergic to many things, including tree pollen, grass seeds, heat, and cold. And I live in Canada. Um, so, you know, like I can't catch a break. There's about like right now we're in the four weeks in autumn that works for me. Um, although I am now getting migraines because of the constant rain. And then in spring, we get another four weeks of not literally allergic to outside, but headaches due to the weather. Point being that for me, it is really difficult to spend time getting to transit stations or, or getting to places either in my chair or walking when I'm able to simply by virtue of being outside. And that is something that if a transit system could find a way to address that, that would be really huge. And even just sort of tiny little interventions like making more sheltered bus stops would be really important. But then we also have to think about, you know, in the pandemic too, um, I, I caught what we don't know for certain, I'm going to get into that first in a sec too, we don't know for certain because I wasn't able to get tested because of car centric infrastructure. But I suspect that I had COVID back in March. And the reason why was because I had to take a bus to a doctor's appointment that I needed to get to. I've been putting it off for months. The bus was very crowded and a couple days later I came down with very COVID-like symptoms. It was a mild case, but I also have had a severe exacerbation of my autoimmune system symptoms for the last six months. And like two of my doctors have confirmed that it sounds like it probably was long COVID. And that's like a real issue for me right now. I don't feel safe taking public transit as an immunocompromised person. And I have places I need to get like, for example, medical appointments that I also physically just can't get to by wheeling or walking. And so those are like real conundrums that we need to think about. And then at the same time, we also need to think about the ways in which car centric infrastructure really disadvantages disabled people as well by, for example, making it impossible for me to get a COVID test because they have one testing center for my entire city of 130,000 people that is not even particularly central. So you can either choose to wheel four kilometers while you're coughing badly or take public transit or take a taxi and potentially expose everyone on there. So just complex issues and, and a lot of sort of experiences that tend to get erased. And the reason that we are sort of dumping all of this on you is to try and get you to thinking to think about the questions that you do need to be asking, because this is it's a really hard challenge because without doing sort of deep and involved work and engaging for a long time with the disabled community, it's hard to know what are the right questions to ask. It's hard to know who are the right people to recruit. It's hard to know how to segment your users in ways other than sort of the very basic categories that Liz talked about, because how do you know what's even a relevant thing to ask? So we're trying to sort of give you a very broad and shallow overview of some of the different things that tend to get overlooked when thinking about disability in transportation infrastructure and urban design. And so one of the things that I want to sort of recommend when thinking about asking the right questions are sort of themes around accessibility rather than sort of those those standard categories of, of disability that Liz talked about, which are sort of very, very rigid and like often sort of pinned to assisted devices or to physical impairments, which sort of goes, it, it exists in tension with that idea of the social model too, if we're accepting that disability is created within the built world and by society, then it seems odd to then sort of force it back into these diagnostic categories to think about. And as Liz explained, you can sort of see how much gets flattened when you do that as well. So instead, starting to think about some of the different factors and categories of inaccessibility that can be encountered. And so, yes, there is the built environment, and that includes pedestrian cycling, transit and automobile infrastructure, also public transportation vehicles, stations, things like that. And, and also, you know, the, the ticket machines within the stations, everything that is quite literally built. But there's also the natural environment and that's going to have to shape the way that you respond through the built environment. So for example, terrain, um, I know Vancouver's pretty hilly. I'm not sure how Seattle is, but sort of hilly terrain, obviously, can be a huge barrier for wheelchair users. Climate. So for instance, here we thankfully my city's pretty level, but again, eight months of the year, it's 
difficult to impossible for me to get around in the winter we have we get so much snow here that I literally cannot go further than about a block from my building I cannot get to the closest bus stop like I literally can't the snow is too high and it blocks me and they obviously don't plow it um and I can't get to the grocery store so I then end up wasting money getting groceries delivered all winter um there's also time and we talked I think a little bit about this I, I mentioned the concept of temporal poverty and this is particularly with energy limiting disabilities but also with a lot of other disabilities just because you spend so much time navigating inaccessibility and taking detours and navigating barriers and waiting for barriers to be fixed and waiting for the person to come and let you onto the the chair lift it's a concept called crypt time and it's this idea that sort of the experience of being a disabled person you you experience time differently it's a lot slower it there's a lot more fluctuation and waiting and sort of distortion um and you have to plan services around that as well and so like the the example that comes to mind immediately for me is that when I'm taking a bus and I have to transfer it stresses me out so much because I, I use my chair when I'm on the bus and it takes a few minutes for the driver to come back to unhook all of the straps securing my chair let down the ramp let me get off and then do the same thing for the other bus and I I am always worried if there's like a, a tight transfer time I'm always worried am I not going to make the bus because it took me just that much longer to get unloaded and similarly um you know if if there are barriers if if the transfer point isn't one that I've used before I, I'm never entirely sure is there going to be a barrier and I'm just not going to be able to get my transfer bus and then I'm going to be stuck waiting to find a route home so there's you know sort of planning around the uncertainty that sort of characterizes so much of disabled existence and and the time consumingness of that uncertainty um, and then similarly information not knowing what to expect is itself an access barrier because again if i don't know exactly how that's that transfer point is laid out if i don't know what the curb cuts are like and where they are if i don't know whether the bus driver is going to uh message over to the next bus driver and say hey i've got a chair user can you wait a little bit before taking off so that they can get to you and some of the drivers here are fantastic and will do that and some of them don't because it's not a policy it's not really their fault that they don't do that that's not sort of ingrained in the system but again having that uncertainty is itself an access barrier it adds it it can you know throw an outing completely off it can mean it can mean the difference of whether I make an appointment or whether I don't but it also just adds so much stress and fatigue to the experience of navigating public space as a disabled person cost is another huge one which is that again as i've mentioned a few times disabled people disproportionately live with low income and also experience something called liz sorry can you also throw up the crypt tax hashtag um crypt tax hashtag was um a hashtag created by another disabled activist called sam delev and it talks about um this experience where we often have to pay extra just to access life and so examples of crypt taxes are We've talked about Liz and I have talked about at being chronically ill, we tend to fluctuate and wait a lot depending on meds, depending on illness flares. So each of us keeps essentially two different sets of genes because we need our our weight goes up genes and we need our weight goes down genes. And that's not something we're doing deliberately or trying to control. It's just how our bodies go when we're flaring or when we're adjusting meds. And so having sort of a duplicate wardrobe, you know, if you're even able to afford that, is a crypt tax. For me, most of the meds to control my autoimmune condition which is quite rare are only available as over-the-counter meds and therefore aren't covered by any drug plans and so therefore i spend about 200 to 300 dollars a month on meds because they're just the only meds for my condition are not prescribed and there are so many things like um you know back back in the day when i my narcolepsy was untreated i was constantly running late for things so i would constantly be having to take taxis to get to my meetings for work because otherwise i just wasn't going to make the meeting on time and so i'd spend money that i didn't have on a taxi so we're going to switch a little bit to uh switch gears a little bit to how to reach disabled people and i'm going to throw it back to liz for that um so i was brought in by um the mta this was probably um two years ago or so. Um, I, I think that they were trying to, again, to figure out, you know, like, 
what is this sort of misalignment that's kind of happening between the, the MTA and disabled communities? There seems to be a lot of pent up frustration on both parts. And one of, I was actually surprised, one of the things that they said to me was, is that there, I don't know if, if you're all aware, but in New York City, only about one third of um, subway stations actually have elevators, right? And so you get on the subway, and to the extent that the, the announcement will tell you if it is or isn't uh, an, uh, an accessible subway. Um, and then you'll have to ride downtown, circle around, come back uptown just so you can get off the subway. And so essentially what they said to me was is that there's extreme hesitancy by the MTA to begin to rectify this because as they said, what they have found is, is you put an elevator in one subway and disabled people, um, we don't say thank you, right? What, what do we say? We say, well, what about all the other subways? What about all the other stations? And so it's like, it's sort of like letting the cat out of the bag. You, you do one elevator and then you have this, this thing to deal with. And I was like, well, I think you don't, I think you're kind of looking at this the wrong way. And basically what I said to them was, is, you know, like, how are you framing these, these, um, elevators as you put them in. And what the MTA said was, is, um, you know, we're, we're essentially telling New Yorkers, like, look what we did for you, right? Look how we helped. And I said, well, New Yorkers don't see it that way. Like we see it as though we've been fighting for decades for access. And maybe some of this misalignment could ease if these, these um, elevator launches were done more in collaboration with the disabled community. So Alex is going to briefly get into stakeholder engagement, but I just wanted you to keep that in mind because a lot of the harm that is done is not necessarily in access. A lot of the harm is actually messaging. And so Alex. Yeah. And I want to be really cognizant of the fact that we want to leave some time for Q and A. And so I'm actually we have sort of a whole bunch of ideas here around how to reach disabled stakeholders specifically and also sort of planning for accessible engagement. Now, the, the nice thing is that we're coming back on Friday and we have this asynchronous workshop planned where essentially um, we, Barb has been kind enough to procure an anonymized document for us that is looking at um, a, essentially a research project on urban infrastructure. And what we're gonna do is we're, sorry, I'm talking and clicking and typing and that never works. All right, copying and pasting this into the chat. Uh, I'm gonna share the document now. So essentially this is a document which has the relevant sections of a research report from an urban infrastructure project. And what we've done is we've created some prompts that are sort of representative of the kinds of questions that we would be asking ourselves if we were doing a research audit um, in consultation with a project like this. And so instead of sort of going through in detail um, a lot of these points about how to reach disabled people and do stakeholder engagement, accessible engagement, I think we're actually going to postpone that and talk a little bit about that on Friday. And, and we sort of want to, I'd like to leave it more with you as just sort of food for thought, thinking about how are the ways that you would typically be trying to reach out to disabled people now? What are some of the ways, given some of the themes that Liz and I talked about today, the things that tend to get overlooked in how we think about disability? What are some of the ways that might shift the way you might do outreach? And then we can sort of regroup on Friday, discuss the ideas that have come up, uh, questions that have come up, and how those relate to the way that we tend to approach these kinds of research projects. But I do want to throw it back, um, Liz, really quickly, if you want to talk about hyphen status because I do think that's a really important thing to keep in mind here as well. Uh, yeah, no, happy to. Um, you know, and I think this felt like the thing that I most wanted to convey here, which is that something that I've really come to struggle with is um, when somebody thanks me for my feedback. Thank you for your feedback. It feels to me like the end of a conversation. It feels like when someone says thank you for your feedback, essentially what I or whomever have lost is the how the knowledge um, or information, oftentimes knowledge and information of lived experience, right? I've lost control of how that's going to be used, right? And thank you for your feedback is a signal that you are no longer in control of the, the labor, the, the information that you provided. 
Um, I am sort of really weirdly into sports and um, I came across this term called hyphen status and hyphen status was initially applied to the, uh, the student athlete, right? You have student hyphen athlete. And essentially what they said about hyphen status in the NCAA is that whatever uh, falls after the hyphen is uh, systematically uncompensated. Um, and so this is a lot of the work that Alex and I have been doing this past couple of years is we've been basically applying hyphen status as it uh, applies to uh, the, the NCAA to um, disability and design. And essentially what you find is, is you have the user hyphen expert, you have the co hyphen creator, the co hyphen collaborator. And yet the logic stays the same. Whatever falls after the hyphen remains, I would say not only systematically uncompensated, but also is uncredited, um, lacks autonomy, loses control of the information they provided. And so one of the questions I want to pose to you is, is how is it that you can begin to engage in community with these stakeholders and not just boil them down to hyphen status from whom you're going to thank for your feedback? Um, because just from my own experience, it is a deeply painful thing to navigate. Um, it is the thing that I most want to address. And I just see like how much work is being done in mobility justice. And I feel like this is really truly a space where we can kind of begin to liberate ourselves from the constraints of thank you for your feedback and hyphen status. Um, and yeah, so with that, um, does anybody have questions? This is Barb, I'm looking quickly and I've been monitoring the chat and we've all been sharing links in there, but I'm not yet seeing questions. So please folks, have at it. If you were holding back out of politeness after this is early comment, now is the time to unleash the fingers. Um, I also, I want to acknowledge that Armando Zelada, um, when I was, oh, let's see. Um, okay, I want to acknowledge Armando Zolada. So um, they said that many, this was earlier when I was talking about language, they said that many medical people use person first identities as well. I also want to acknowledge that there are very likely um, people with disabilities and disabled people in this chat. And if you want to identify yourself as an expert, uh, we would love to hear from you. Um, and I'll throw back to Barb. Yeah. All right. And we've got a question from Salwa Raphael asking about how temporary construction could be improved. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And so for me, a huge one, actually, again, it goes back to this issue of not providing information is itself an access barrier. And so I literally, I think, I think I'd complained to you already about this, Barb. I think this had happened just before our last call. But so I, I have a broken wrist at the moment, which happened due to another experience with inaccessibility. But after I got this lovely improved cast, which gave me greater mobility because I can move my thumb now and I no longer have my thumb in a sticker, I was going for a lovely wheel and I encountered some construction on the sidewalk, a construction barrier, and I didn't know. It was an incredibly long block. It was probably like at least 150 meters, if not more, to get back to the previous intersection, which is where the closest curb cut was. The driveways on that street are, they're too steep to function as curb cuts. Um, and it's also quite a busy street. So I didn't feel super comfortable jaywalking because also as a wheelchair user, this is another thing, cars do not tend to notice me. Like they're, they're not great at noticing pedestrians or cyclists. They are so much worse at noticing wheelchairs. Like ambulatory people just walking will trip over me. They will just literally walk into me and fall and then scream. This has happened. People have shrieked when they suddenly tripped over me because they didn't notice me. Cars do it too, and that's even more terrifying. Like they will just start driving and I have to like wheel back and get back onto the sidewalk regularly. Um, so jaywalking is like a big no for me. Anyway, so my choice was essentially I could try and wheel through this person's front yard to get around the construction or go back about 150 meters um, to get back to the nearest curb cut and then sort of take a detour. And I was tired, like also, Dealing with this fracture, I've just been tired. So I chose to navigate through the, the yard and it was a student house. So the yard was not well maintained. So my caster caught in a divot. I tipped forward and I wrenched my thumb and I managed to make the sprain even worse. And I'm waiting for a CT scan tomorrow to see what I did. 
Um, point being, if there had been a sign at the previous intersection letting me know that construction was coming up, that would have prevented that because I could have just crossed at the intersection and not had to make that choice of like whether to fatigue myself more, which is itself an injury for me because when I'm fatigued, that worsens my autoimmune symptoms. Um, so it's not just a matter of like, oh, I was just taking, taking the easy route and I made a bad choice. Like there would have been consequences for me too if I'd chosen to go back. So signage information, huge. Also um, providing temporary ramps, sort of where, wherever essentially a pit has been blocked, providing temporary ramps is huge and necessary. Um, and as Liz mentioned, also making sure that the construction of those ramps is solid enough or has enough support under it that it can also support a power chair because similarly, what works for me as a curb cut or ramp as a, as a manual wheelchair user is very different than what a power chair user needs to be functional. And then I would also say, getting back to the point about how cars do not notice you, if there's construction scaffolding, just finding ways to increase visibility both for the person who's crossing and for the car because as much of a risk as there is for pedestrians and cyclists, there is even more of a risk for chair users. So I wanna just take a moment, just cause we have a, a few minutes left. Um, so Evan, uh, Alex and I will respond to your question on Twitter um, after the event, um, but I wanted to touch on Karen's question, which is what do you want from us between now and your next presentation time? Uh, so yes, uh, the thing that Alex and I have found is that um, um, when we give presentations, it can oftentimes be the end of a story. Um, and so what we have found is, is that if we can engage in a shared analysis, um, what that does is it opens the door for larger conversations. And so whereas usually Alex and myself uh, conduct the analysis on our own and then return to a team. Uh, what we want to do instead, and this is actually the first time we've tried this, so we're not entirely sure how it's going to play out. We are open to your interpretation, but we thought it would be interesting if you could um, join us in partaking in that shared analysis. And so at the top of it, what we have listed are a series of prompts. Again, these are very much the things that we would look for um, in a document. And these are the things that we would be analyzing. Um, and so again, it's just really about us trying to, to kind of give you that, that lens. Um, and then what we would do, so you have the, the duration of the week to kind of glance it over, look through it, consider these things for yourself. You can respond to things directly. You can comment to things directly in the document or you can just leave a comment if a, a thought or a question has been provoked. Again, we're not trying to create work for you. We're just trying to um, you know, work with you to kind of start seeing these things for yourself. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll regather on Friday um, and we'll go through the document together and see what came up for everybody, see what you know, Alex and I might notice. Um, and again, uh, look through those things that we weren't able to touch on um, uh, today. And, and just sort of adding really quickly to like, this is not a situation where there are right or wrong answers. Um, and, and especially, you know, we're, we're sort of just introducing you to this and we've taken you through this at like a whiplash pace. Um, and so, you know, yeah, we're not expecting you to have right answers. We're not even expecting you to have answers to all the questions, but we wanna get you sort of just started with this process of just reflecting on the ways that you do things currently and what are some of the ways that you might shift in order to reach some of the people you're not currently reaching and what are some of the things that maybe you've overlooked in terms of the things that you might be missing currently. And I also just want to say, yeah, I'm really looking forward to responding to Evan's question. So Twitter. Yeah. yeah. I threw in a comment for folks who don't know, you can read the tweets in somebody's public Twitter profile without having an account and consider this research, consider it a, an archive full of knowledge to be mined, data mined, you can follow a hashtag and see who's talking about it. That's part of their research protocol. But, but for those of us who are public employees, this is genuinely a very rich body of information and people will interact with both agencies and individuals who work for agencies on Twitter. It's like getting an email from a constituent when somebody pings me on Twitter to ask me a question. So um, just in case you're worried about your social media guidelines for your agency, you might have those, but this is information. I just wanted to throw and that I using uh, quick, sorry oh, I, yes sorry, I, 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 I love 
that, honestly, that is going to be a big part of what we talk about on Friday too, is just like how to use Twitter as a research resource. Cause it is, it is a fantastic resource. So, so remember this is Monday. You have the opportunity to work with Alex and Liz again Friday when they're doing the bookend workshop and get into this working document that we dropped into the chat. The next session today is investigating mobility, justice, and safety. That's at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard. And remember to check the chat here or the feedback form on this session. And thanks so much for participating in the summit, everybody. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you everyone for your time.